Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second part of this lecture: surface science of metal oxides, concepts, methods, and latest results. So, I, um, as of yesterday, I I want to go over the ground rules. So, uh, it would be really helpful to me if you are in the office, you could share, you know, and you have enough high speed internet connection. If you could turn on the screen, so I see a few faces. It's very difficult for me to talk to my computer. Um, please do ask questions. I'm eternally grateful to Pavel for yesterday asking me questions. Uh, and if something is not clear, please to interrupt me. You know, I can go on for hours. I have no interest in going through the material. I really would like people to understand and especially people who are not from the area to understand. And as of yesterday, we will also ask questions. Now, Bojena and I agreed that we would do it a little bit differently because I will ask two questions today. The first one is a little bit of recap to see um, if you paid attention yesterday. And the second one will set up the stage for the later part of the talk. And we will be doing it a little bit differently because for answering these questions, you need to see what's on my screen. So uh, Bojala has sent up something that's called Mentimeter. Never mind, you just click on the link in the chat, right, Bojala? That's how it should be. Okay, perfect. So this was the outline, concepts and methods. Um, yesterday we already talked about, you know, the crystal structure of oxide materials and, you know, the simple concept how to predict oxide surfaces. I made a little remark why we need ultra high vacuum. And then I spent a lot of time talking about scanning probe microscopy. Essentially, we went to one picture of one, one, one with four, with three images, and I tried to explain to you how we get them and how we get them information. So today I want to continue that. Um, and then I want to get to these more recent results. Let's see how far we get. Again, if we don't. That's fine too. You can read our papers, uh, or I'm happy to you know, talk to you later if anyone is particularly interested in one of these topics. So, brief recap of yesterday's lecture. Essentially, that's what we talked about. So, this is the rutile TO2110 surface. Uh, we talked about that these are titanium atoms, oxygen atoms are always red. Oxygen atoms are twofold coordinated on the surface because they miss one partner. The tenum atoms are five-fold coordinated on the surface, six-fold octahedral in the bulk. Again, they miss one partner. These are the so-called, what we call, what consider surface atoms. I also showed you that when we have a really, um, so when you have a small uh, a, a, a sample that we have treated in ultra high vacuum, then we have it reduced it, taken out oxygen, and on the surface disappear these oxygen vacancies. Um, I showed you three images that were taken at the same part of the sample. So it's exactly the same area, but different signals in scan probe microscopy. This is non-contact AFM. We started talking a little bit about in detail what we see. Essentially, you see these oxygen atoms and then a hole when there is a vacancy. And then Pavel asked these nice questions, what happens here? So there's some relaxations. Some of the oxygens move down a little bit when you make, make this oxygen. So the neighbors change a little bit their position, their lateral position, which I just discussed with, with Christian, I think. That's right. Then, in fact, even so, this gives the released information. Um, this is traditionally what is used, scanning, tunneling, microscopy, imaging the empty states, meaning uh, you um, the sample is charged positively, electrons tunnel from the tip to the sample. And then whenever there is an oxygen missing, uh, one sees a change in electronic structure. So you have more density of states here and that increases the, tun the signal. So that increases the tunneling current. That's where we see a bright spot here. Sorry. And then uh, with filled states, one only sees the elect extra electrons at this particular bias voltage, one only sees the electrons that come out of the sample. Uh, these are in the gap states. So these are electrons that in the band gap of the, of the system, those are these extra electrons 
they are located at the tenum atoms and from the way this appears, we can say something how they're localized. All right, so again, usually in STM, so 99% of papers out there in the literature, and there's many about STM of oxides are empty states in constant current mode. So I told you yesterday already, this is the density of electronic states. So the number of states per, elect per energy, so uh, electrons with this particular energy in the lattice and how many, how many states there are. And the ones that are filled are mostly oxygen derived just because oxygen is electronegative and the ones that are uh, empty are most metal derived because the metal gives the electrons to the oxygens. We talked about that. And then the Fermi level, the reference level, which is the reference level we apply a voltage to is here at the lower end edge of the conduction band. So we talked about when you have fluctuate to 110, the tip in constant current mode goes down when there is an oxygen because there's in empty states, there's little empty states above the oxygen atom. So the local density of states, how many density of states, how many electrons, possible electron density of states are one at one particular atom changes when you go to the lattice from atom to atom. We also talked about this indium oxide. It has the very strange but absolutely useful property of being at the same time transparent, yet electrically very conducting. We talked about it has a complicated, it's first side complicated crystal structure, but as many other oxides, you have the indium in the center and then six oxygen atoms around it, octahedral. In this case, actually, all these bonds are a little bit distorted. So it's not so regular. If you look, all of these bonds have a little bit different length. And then if you look at periodicity, that gives a large unit cell of one nanometer in size. And then if you cut it in one, one, one direction, you get a low energy surface. This is the top view. This is the side view of the surface. So looking from top look of the side and within the unit cell on the surface of so the repeat cell, there is a total of 40 atoms, um, 16 indium atoms. The blue ones are six fold coordinated. So they have the same number of indium atoms in the volume in the bulk and 12 are five fold coordinated. Those are the green ones. And then there are 12 oxygen atoms that have threefold coordination that means those are, have missed a part right so there's a lot of going on even this is the repeat cell even though this is a perfect lattice there's many atoms with many different bonding partners and that will become important in the later talk later part of the lecture i didn't mention yesterday but i think it's pretty clear to everyone the surface has threefold symmetry so you know look here threefold symmetry threefold symmetry as a threefold symmetric. All right, now coming to my first question, please, Bojana, then. So, uh, one second. So, uh, so this is the way one generally does things, right? One takes empty states, constant current STM images. This is a very nicely prepared indium oxide surface. You can see these are step edges, so one layer up next layer up, next layer up, like bricks, right? So one layer, next layer, next layer. And then the, what we call atomically resolved images, you can see this characteristic, almost like honeycomb pattern. And um, this is empty states with a bias voltage of plus 1.5 volts. So that means this is the reference. That means we sampling here, this is the calculated density of states, empty density of states. So the ones that we are tunneled into, right? And um, this is calculated the density of states, the number of electronic states that are possible to tunnel into, atomically resolved for all the different indium atoms I mentioned before. You can see there's so many different ones. We call them A, B, C, D, E to, to F, each of them because each of them is bonded a little bit differently. Each of them has a little bit different density of states. Okay. So when we do empty states STM, now comes the question. In empty states STM images, 
this yellow triangle that I have marked here on the atomic model, will this one in STM images be bright or dark or Bosnian suggested yellow? So please, Mentimeter is open. Yes, it's in the chat. Okay. Please give the answer. And you know it's anonymized. So, so definitely the uh, uh, opinion is that half of the people is voting for the bright and half for dark. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So someone uh, requested that he, I guess Jan, is a guy, uh, wanted to get the access to my computer screen. So please, who was this? I am not sure. Mistake? Maybe I just misclicked because I clicked uh, back to window from the uh, from no, the web browser for voting. So. Uh, okay, Jan, you are an expert, so show us. I'm sure you know. <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, I, I was thinking because I just wanted to manage in time. So okay. So so this triangle, right? This triangle is the atoms. These are these atoms. So you have to figure out which are these atoms. They are D and it's B. D and so D they are and B. D and B. Okay, D and B, you can see this is the relevant. Okay, they have the low density, the low density, density of states. Yes. So deep has to come closer to send the same current. Mm -hmm. And if it comes closer, it means in set it's darker. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, how can you stop that you can annotate because I want to keep going? Or... I don't know if it's me because I didn't. Maybe you just refuse. I don't know how to refuse. Just simply once some someone nice person a nice series gives you and tells you what is the electronic structure, you can interpret these images, but without this interpret. So let me show you. This is this is um, STM images. This is this yellow triangle here, right? And you can see it's dark, as Jan correctly predicted. These are DFT calculations, and this yellow triangle is dark because the density of states is low. So the tip, in order to keep the current constant, there's less states to kind of into the deep has to go down. What I want to show you here is that without, even though we call this atomically resolved STM, it's really hard to actually see each individual atom, and one definitely needs to have some theoretical input to understand what these images are. In fact, when we were, saw them in the beginning, we were very, we were very uh, confused about what we were seeing. So, but with the help of theory, as mentioned in the beginning, theory and experiment in surface science really go hand in hand. We can really interpret these images, and we can do all sorts of really nice experiments. Okay, so. Coming back now, we discussed in detail how to understand this uh, empty state STM images. Now let me come to this non-contact AFM, which is the hot new tool we have in oxide surface science. So I already talked about this yesterday. You take an STM tip, so that's a tungsten wire that's etched to a very sharp tip at the end, atomically very well controlled. And it's mounted on what essentially is a tuning fork. So a tuning fork with two prongs. One can oscillate freely, the other one is put to the sample holder. And this one then oscillates with its own resonance frequency of several tens of kilohertz um, with very low damping. And this oscillation frequency is because it's a quartz crystal. Uh, this oscillation, this um, also, this frequency is then converted into a voltage that one can measure. Now, when you bring this end of the tip close to the sample, because of the interaction between the tip and the sample, the resonance frequency changes. So this is a generic curve, how it changes. There's little interaction very far away. Uh, then you come closer, a, a, attractive interaction. The resonance frequency changes then at some point it goes the opposite way when you come to come to repulsive or repulsive interaction when you come too close. So this is a curve, how this frequency changes as a function of putting the distance in and out of the sample. 
Okay, so I parked at one place in and out of the sample. And the way this actually works is that the whole the whole tuning fork is shaken a little bit with a amplitude of something in the order of 0.1 angstrom or 0.2 angstrom or so. If you shake it a little bit, you go back and forth on this resonance curve and this change in resonance frequency while uh, this change. So this, this signal here, the signal is then the one, the modulation signal is then the one that we measure. Okay. So this is the one that we measure. And then um, I asked this question yesterday, what is essential for atomically resolved on contact FM? And we gave you three choices and everyone who was still awake at the end of my lecture said it's the tip. Yes, that's true. So this is a very famous picture from Leo Gross uh, from 2009 where he used one of these tuning forks, they're called Q plus sensor, and at the end of this tungsten wire, he mounted a CO molecule, carbon monoxide molecule, this is the oxygen, the oxygen and carbon. And with this one, you have a very well-defined last atom because it's the interaction between the last atom of the tip and the atoms of the sample that is really essential for this chemical contrast is essential for this interaction. They, they, this interaction is what one wants to probe. And that's a very famous picture. This is a pentacene molecule on uh, two monolayers of sodium chloride and a copper one one, one crystal. This is a STM images. So this is the density of states, if you wish, or the orbitals. There's no way you can get any better than that because you look, you know, the electrons, they are distributed, they smeared out, right? So the, even though it's atomic resolved, they don't see the atoms. But because these forces are much more directional, you can then very clearly see all of these phenyl rings within this pentacin molecule. Now, the question is, how do you functionalize this tip, right? How do you get this CO molecule? And in fact, you know, if you, if you would have a bigger look at the sample people use, they use the copper, surface, a copper one on one single crystal, they make little islands of sodium chloride to the cup. And then on top of that, they looked at molecules that sit on top of the sodium chloride, which is decouples them a little bit from the substrate. And then on, on the copper, there is, because even if this perfect vacuum, there's always a little bit of carbon monoxide in our vacuum chambers, and they appear dark in STM images. You just go there and then apply a little voltage and snatch up these CO molecules. So that's how I do this functionalization. And this works really, really well for molecules. Um, people have published the most fantastic images of molecules on surfaces with this non-contact AFM because it's beautiful, right? You can directly see how, how they look like, as long as they're flat, I should say. But as long as they're flat, you can really look at how these molecules look like like a chemist who draws it. And this is, of course, a wonderful technique for oxides as well. Um, not so many people have tried to use it. So we've tried uh, a few years ago, we've started doing it. So we got this really nice image I showed it before with this missing oxygen atoms. And it turns out the CO functionalization that works beautiful for all molecules doesn't really work well for oxides. It just just doesn't give good images. What we have found is actually what this what we have found is that what um sorry what works really well is uh, when you have a tip with the very so this should be a model of the very few last atoms of the tip, um, and the very last atom is an oxygen atom, and actually the tip itself, not the wire. The wire is tungsten. But the very end of the tip is actually sorry, is actually titanium oxide. And the reason is one always does this tip preparation during tunneling. So you kind of apply high current pulses or high high voltage pulses. And if you do that on a TO2 surface, you kind of tuck in the tip a little bit. And then material comes and accumulates on the on the very end of this of this needle, right? And that's actually a reproducible way because it just get whatever you 
image with your STM tip, you get at the very end of the needle. And um, this is now from one of uh, a recent result from Igor Sokolovich in my group, uh, who is a very talented student because he not only did the experiments, but also the calculations. So this is a two two one on all surface. It has the great detail already, oxygen rose, non-contact constant height AFM. So what we see here is uh, what the signal is, is actually the change in the change in um, in resonance frequency when you scan the tip across back and forth, right? Uh, we see the oxygen atoms, we see a missing oxygen atom as a vacancy. I showed you this curve before. So what happens is when you are in very close to the surface, so this goes in constant height mode. So you, you go across here and at each position here, you shake the tip up and down a little bit and measure how much the frequency changes when you shake it. And since the oxygen atoms are sticking out, when you shake it a little bit, you can see back and forth, the change in resonance frequency that you see is really high. So that gives you a high signal. Here, when you in constant height mode above these titanium atoms, let's say you're further out, you shake the tip by, I don't know what it was here, point to angstrom. So, so there's hardly any change in the resonance frequency. So what you see is dark. So someone, I think it was Pavel, asked me yesterday how to interpret. This is really what you interpret, right? Now, I will not go into detail, but actually this is absorbing of molecular oxygen on TO2. There is about 40 or 50 papers out in the literature about how oxygen absorbs on TO2. You wouldn't believe how many people are interested in, because it's actually an essential mechanism for chemical gas sensing. And all of them have completely confusing, completely confusing uh, results. And what Iga found that is there are four different types of ways this oxygen can absorb molecular in two configurations. It can dissociate, it can go into vacancy. And with non-contact AFM, we can see all of them really directly. So this was one paper we could publish in, in this nice journal because you can really clarify all the confusion that was out there, right? And the essential was, so actually, the nice thing is it kind of comes for free, right? You, you scan image the surface, you sometimes pay a tip that gives you a little bit of TO2 on there. You make these oxygen atoms by dissociating the oxygen by putting extra electron in and then you snatch up one. You can just go close and take it with the tip, and then after you take an image, you can see it's gone, then you know we have an oxygen atom at the very end of the tip, and that gives you this beautiful contrast. Okay, so that's how we functionalize this tip in non-contact AFM. Um, yeah, so um, just maybe a little bit more. So what, what um, again, there's theory and experiment. Okay, so it's a little bit busy slide, but this is the image I just showed you. They have all the different species that are available or that form on this surface. This is a calculated non-contact AFM image. And it's really, it was a big, big, huge calculation on our supercomputer. Because what, what, um, what uh, Igor did here is he at each position on top of the surface. So he set up this in DFT calculations. So you take a slab with periodic boundary conditions. So that's the TO2. Um, then you put this tip model that I just showed you, this one, you do a DFT calculation, uh, then you move it a little bit closer, do a DFT calculation again, do a DFT calculation again, and each time you calculate what is the force between the tip and the surface, and you plot as a function of Z, you plot as a function of C, how the force changes when you go from very far away, closer. You can see first is attractive interaction and then at some point repulsive interaction on all these different species, so on all the different oxygen species. So this is calculations using this type of model for the tip. And these are the measured force distance curves. So do the same thing you can with the tip, park it on top of one of these molecules, tau, let's say, right? 
you go in and you measure the frequency, the integrated frequency, you get the force, you measure the force as a function of tip surface interaction. So you can see there's not perfect agreement. So, you know, we are the right order of magnitude. So the tip sample interaction force is something in the order of piconewtons not perfect but pretty good agreement which means that essentially our tip model is okay maybe not perfectly right okay. so any questions maybe i have tomas shikola yeah what, tip, what is the success rate in preparation of such a tip <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, depends on the operator. Okay, so uh, some people are really good in doing this. So actually, once you have the sample prepared like this, there's many ways you can check if the tip is right. But once you have it prepared like this, uh, and you snatch the so like taking the la very last atom, I think is actually pretty okay. So, but my people spent way more time preparing the tip than the sample. And some people are more, more skilled than others in doing it, but we get pretty good. Yeah, I must admit I'm no longer in the lab. I just see these beautiful <laughs> images in the end. I know they spent, once the tip is prepared, they spent the whole night doing the measurement. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. I will. I will maybe ask a question. Just what does it actually involve preparing the tip? I mean, I you know. What I does it involve? Say, it involves this is an atomic manipulation. So there must be some kind of a, you know. Yeah. yeah. It, okay. It involves. Procedure there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It involves um, essentially. So the first thing is you physically make this tip that you do etching outside, you mount it on this cantilever. You stick it in the vacuum chamber. We first do field emission. So we put it in front of another sacrificial sample with a very high voltage that forms the tip to a sharp needle or even sharper needle we get to etching. Then you go typically to a copper single crystal. You start doing STM. You look if your tip is sharp. You see that if there's any sort of double tip, if the step edges look like, you dunk it in sometimes when you want to have a metallic tip. Then you go on the sample that you want to image like tier two, you do STM, you see if the tip is still sharp, and then you um, do, at some point you park it, you apply high voltage pulse. So typically tunneling conditions are, you know, a few volts, suddenly you go up to like five volts, the tip reacts, dunks in, and then some material is transferred to the tip. And then if you, once you have, you can tell if the tip and the sample have the same material, if you measure the local contact potential, I don't, you know, happy to go into it if you're interested in how to do that, but you can tell that. And then once you have the very last atom doing that, it's just scanning here, seeing there's an oxygen atom going closer snatching it up and then you can see the atom is gone so do i understand it correctly that the oxygen atom which is on the tip of the tip mm -hmm. that may be coming from the sample which is being imaged yes actually. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly right. Right. and and you know that it's one atom because of how it behaves then I suppose. yes because if it's more than one the images become smeared out right because you kind of interact two atoms at the same time. It's looking mm -hmm. like cross side. You see, you see an image that has like two two images at the same mm -hmm. time okay. being displaced from each other. Mm -hmm. oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So, coming back to this indium oxide that you guys just analyzed for these indium atoms. Now let's look at these twelve surface, actually all the surface oxygen atoms. So what here? What happened is. This is a non-contact AFM image of an indium oxide surface. Again, here's the model. Here is the change in frequency. You can see the parameters, five Kelvin, 
If you don't do it at 5 Kelvin, things are not really stable, constant height, moving back and forth, a little bit of bias voltage on the sample, shaking the tip up and down with 50 picometers amplitude. This is, sorry, this is the resonance frequency, 47 hertz, and this is how much by scanning constant height, the frequency changed while going back and forth between minus five and minus eight hertz, okay? And this one was taken, so this one was taken with a tip that was prepared, the first scanning and TO2 sample, snatching up the oxygen atom, exchanging the sample into the STM, taking out the TO2, putting in the indium oxide, and then taking this wonderful image. So. We have this tip that I showed you before, the little tip that gave quantitative agreement for the CO2 and have now imaged the indium oxide with it. Admittedly, not simple, but possible. And the upshot is we see each atom. So let me show you. These are these 12, these are these oxygen atoms that we have here. I circled only the ones that are threefold coordinated. They're all different ones in the unit cell. You can see they're all here. You can even see that some look different, right? It's a threefold symmetry. These ones look different. Like here is also some like this. Oops. Here are some like this, and here are some like this, right? And then we have these others, these here. They are here, and here, and here, right? And they're here, and here, and here. So we can see each of these oxygen atoms, identify them, even these ones that are a little bit lower, those are the fourfold coordinated ones with the eyes of love. Okay, maybe not really, but you know, with the eyes of love, you can say, okay, here are the extra oxygen atoms. So no one has ever seen pictures like this. We can identify each oxygen atom with this non-contact agent. Okay. So, uh, and this one has been done with this oxygen terminated TO2 tip. So each of these oxygen atoms as I just showed you, we can directly identify. So this is true atomic resolution. You can do another thing. You can just take, instead of going through this whole procedure and preparing the tip by scanning on a different sample and every once in a while applying a high voltage pulse that brings tip and sample close, you can do the same thing on just on an indium oxide surface. And we know here, actually, we have, I show in a second why we know, we have actually an indium oxide terminated tip with an OH group at the end. And now look what we get. The image looks, comp so this is same, similar, similar uh, parameters, right? Similar amplitude and so forth. Here we see each oxygen atoms, and here we can mark each of these indium atoms. The blue ones that you just identified before, the green ones and so forth. So the tip, right, was our question last yesterday, the tip is essential for interpreting this contrast. All right. Okay, so nice, we see each oxygen atom, beautiful, beautiful pictures, no question. It turns out that actually, so threefold symmetry, so actually these are these oxygen atoms that are always arranged in this kind of diamond-like um, way. And actually these four, even though they look orange and this one red, these four have slightly different bonding. Okay, slightly different bonding. We call this one for reasons, uh, some, I don't know. <laughs> we call this one bit alpha, beta, gamma, delta, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, okay? And the gamma, delta, alpha, they don't look, they look similar in this, in this non-contact AFM images. But if you look now at the electronic density of states calculated, electronic, so these are now the filled states, right? Before we had the empty states, the indium, so the ones that are located at the indium atoms. Now we look at the ones that are located at the oxygen atoms, right? And you can see there is now all these different oxygen atoms, all these different oxygen atoms, and the local density of states 
again looks very different for each of them. Right? So this is the binding energy in electron volts. And you can see they have different density of states, different electronic structure. The reason is just because, you know, they're bonded in different ways. So the neighbors, the indium neighbors are all a little bit different. The bond length is a little bit different so forth. So, Bojana. Yes. Okay. Next question. Next question. At the helium oxide surface, there are four types of oxygen 3C atoms, so the threefold coordinated ones that we're interested in. They're is the, the same is the same same link for the mentimeter? It should be active now. Okay. Thank you. The most reactive one is alpha, beta, gamma, or delta. And here you have the density of states. So it comes to your chemical intuition, right? So if you like, this is the homo states as a function of energy. Which oxygen atom is the most reactive one? Wonderful. Lots of chemists in the audience. So beta is this one. The reason is just that the you know, if you look at the valence band maximum, so these are the states that are highest in energy. So those are the electrons that can most easily interact with others, right? So those are the ones that will be most affected when you have some sort of chemical interaction. So these ones, the oxygen, beta oxygen will be the most reactive ones. Excellent. I Excellent. figured it out. I figured it yes, out. Yes, Pavel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, last time, last time I, I heard about this was 25 years ago when I had chemistry <laughs> at the Mastering University. So. So, you know, it's an achievement. You explained it perfectly. You put an A in my course. Perfect. Okay, super. So, now we come to our explaining you our latest nature paper, okay? Measuring fundamental surface properties at the single atom scale. I've set the stage. So, uh, we, need to need, we need to know one more thing, right? So, actually, um, what we want to look at is the reactivity with respect to water okay of course water water is the most important chemical in life right anyway so one should actually know that even so we work in alta vacuum or when we work in alta vacuum we can very easily put a little bit of water vapor into a system usually we don't like to have that very much because it turns out that water interacts with oxygen with what oxide surface is quite strongly. Another thing that we always have, I mentioned, is carbon monoxide. If you work with metals, carbon monoxide is pretty bad because it interacts quite, quite strongly. This oxide, this oxide surface is not a problem, but a little bit water sticks quite readily. Okay. And then if you have small amounts of water, this oxygen surface becomes immediately hydroxylated. So, for example, if we have our no favorite surface, the root tail Q2110 surface, and we have one of these oxygen vacancies, you have to actually work really hard to make sure there's not a trace amount of water vapor in your outer vacuum chamber. Because if there is, water will come, dissociate, and form two OH groups. All right, so let me show you here. So, the water will come. This would it will make two OH groups. Why? Because one of the oxygen will interact with, you know, fill this vacancy. Here's the proton. It will give the proton to the oxygen next door. It's dissociating, forming two OH groups. We call that the water OH, the green one here, and the surface OH. And this beta is the one for in the oxide. Okay. Anyway, so just to give you. This is a, picture, a movie I've shown many times. We took already 10 years ago. Um, it's like taking STM images one after the other. Empty states as the M images, hard to interpret, but we already know that these are oxygen vacancies here. This is actually an OH group. So there was a little bit of hydroxylation first. One water molecule, let me see if I can play this. How can I play this? Oh, I hope this works now. Yeah, 
you can see to coming, moving apart, forming two age groups, right? So this is actually experimental results of an STM movie that was taken or STM images taken over the course of two hours. So sorry, it didn't work out. Anyway, just a little distraction. Let's go back to this inium oxide surface where you guys just identified um, successfully these beta oxygens. Those are these ones here. It's the most reactive ones. And it turns out when one calculates how water, so there are no oxygen vacancy whatsoever, right? So this is a perfect surface, but it turns out when you do DFT calculations and you find out we put water molecules on the surface in your calculations, you find out that actually dissociation, you know, putting a proton next door is the most uh, energetically favorable condition. So it turns out that um, there's per surface unit cell at room temperature, there's only three water molecules, then it stops per surface unit, Cells, so three water molecules and each of them dissociate and each of them goes to this area that we have identified as this yellow triangle before, right? This area here, because here are the beta oxygen. And what happens is you make two OH groups. This is the water age, it, it absorbs exactly here. And this is the proton given on one of these reactive oxygen atoms. So According to DFT calculations, this is the most favorable condition in an ultra vacuum at 300 Kelvin. You fill up and make these three dissociated water molecules, six total OH groups at room temperature, and then the reaction, simple reaction stops. Okay, and sure enough, that's what we see with non-contact AFM. So this is this pretty picture, I had showed it before. This is this yellow triangle. This is the clean surface with this um, oxygen germinated tip. Once you put a little bit of water vapor on our sample, it's pretty hard, you can imagine, because we're so close, right? We're really, really close to the surface. It's very difficult to avoid that the tip already snatches one OH molecule up at some point. So this is actually, that's why this looks different. So this looks, this is actually similar to the one I showed before where we can see each indium atom. And then this really bright, so these are the indium atoms, but because we know how the surface looks like, we can identify where each atom on the surface sits. These are two OH groups, you can see. One is the one that comes from the original water. And this one is the surface OH group. You can see they're always in, in, in different directions. So here, 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 very isolated. If you add a little bit more water, we can see here is two of them. And here's already this windmill-like structure I tried to show you before. And then if you put saturation, we can actually see exactly what I predicted, right? Always three water molecules sitting at exactly the position that was predicted by theory. Um, one is a little brighter, one is a little bit less bright, and the reason is just that one sticks out a little bit more. Okay, so really nice. You can actually really see each OH group on our surface. Now, you know, um, this comes back to this question of tip manipulation and tip preparation. So this is work by Mar um, Margareta Wagner, who is really good in preparing the tip and doing this wonderful controlled measurement. So here, um, this is a little area on the sample where she did STMs and STM, you don't see STM mode, you don't see these nice atoms, but if you know your surface well around, you can tell what you have. On top of each of these crosses, she did a little bit of tip pulses, so five pulses, 2.8 volts and 2.7 volts. So answering your question, Pavel, how exactly you do that? You do it here, 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 and here. Each time you did that, you can see there's some sort of change, you know, because you scan and something happened while you did that. 
because this it is it's scanning back and forth. So if it's straight line like this, you know something happened your in your in your tunneling junction. This is AFM before this propeller like thing with a total of three water molecules dissociated. Here is the cartoon. Here is where she did this uh, tip pulses. And then afterwards, you can look and see things changed. And for the trained eye, you know, uh, if she could identify what it what, sorry, but for we have here a cartoon for people who are not so familiar. So one, this one, for example, here, you can identify that this proton is given to a delta. Remember, we had oxygen, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, oxygen, delta. This is a beta, and this is an oxygen alpha. So you can tell from these images and from the way they look like after this pulsing, you can move one proton from one to one oxygen atom to another oxygen atom, and by imaging and Triangulating, you can figure out where it went. So this is just one example. She has done this over and over again, many different examples. And the way you can do it, you can really move the proton from this beta oxygen, where it likes to go automatically, to these other ones, to the alpha, to the, to the alpha, and to the data, and so forth, delta, and so forth. Okay, so next thing Margareta did was she did these forced distance curves, right? I showed you before. What right, is right. Sorry, before you, because you seem to be going ahead, would I un answer, uh, ask one, one question? You mm -hmm. say that you put a little water, right? So yes. what, what, do, right. What, what should I imagine under that? Okay. Is there, is there, is there like a, a water molecule sprinkled on the surface, yeah. or so, is there a layer of water on top of the surface? Um, so it's the way it's done. It's in virtually perfect vacuum. Mm -hmm. On this, uh, on our vacuum chambers, we have little what we call leak valves, where we can open and close and put in a very controlled amount of gas. Mm -hmm. Attached to this leak valve is a vial of ultra pure water, molecule water that has been degassed properly. Mm -hmm. uh, you open this valve a little bit, and by the pressurize and time, we can tell how much water we have dosed on the surface. And this is really so water vapor comes moves around the chamber wall, bounces back a few, a few times, eventually it hits the surface, moves around on the surface, finds the perfect spot where it likes to be and dissociates. Talking about a molecule of water, so not water as a, as a phase. Vapor phase. Vapor phase, water vapor, one molecule. And you can see at room temperature in ultra high vacuum, you will form, you can, now, in, so this was done in room temperature, the dosing in vacuum. You can open a valve and leave it open forever. Not more water molecules will absorb at room temperature because they're lo too loosely bound. So they can, the ones that come, come and will dissolve off again oh, okay. at room temperature. So, so it never, it, even in the saturation case, there never is a layer of water on top of the uh, surface. It's always dynamic. Yes, exactly. <laughs> However, you can very easily, Arrhenius, right? E over E adsorption KT. Mm -hmm. When you lower the temperature, mm -hmm. you can change this equilibrium very easily. So what we can do is we can pack way more water molecules on top okay. of it. In fact, the whole layer, by just simply lowering the temperature. And, the, and then the AFM game would be still on or not anymore? <laughs> Yes, yeah. it's still you know, on. We're trying, where is Matthias Flatnik? We're trying to publish this paper where we have actually identified what happens to the next molecule, and the next molecule, and the next molecule. Um, we have measured how strongly they adsorb. We have done DFT calculations where in the unit cell they adsorb, and we have identified them in the end with the AFM. Okay. So, yes, it still works. Paper is hopefully be submitted ah. soon. Okay, great. Right. Let's move on. I, I don't want to sure. visit. Happy, happy to answer these questions. All right. 
So coming back to these force distance curves I've showed you. So this is actually these calculations that I alluded to that Igor did also, right? So these are really first principle calculations. Each one is one full run. You relax each atom, the tip. You have to kind of invent. You know how the surface looks like. You have that under control, I told you, right? The tip, we know we have indium oxide on top of it because it's hard to avoid actually, right? Uh, when you make these pulses, some material goes on it. You very likely have an OH group at the end of it. When you go in and out, you can see someone asked me about how things change. You can see that when the tip is close, actually it makes a hydrogen bond with this proton, right? So it comes in and out, it makes a hydrogen bond that goes back out a bit. And you can see there's quite some relaxation. So each, at each position, the system is relaxed. So the way it goes is, you know, atoms are a little bit moved towards the lowest energy configuration. So this is a quite realistic picture of what happens when you do these force distance curves. Okay. So, and then I should mention, so it's a little bit, what, what is this is there's a hydrogen bond formed between the last atom of the tip and this proton, right? So the tip and this sample kind of pull on this proton a little bit. It's like a little thick track of war, right? And you can imagine that if this proton here is really strongly bound, then this hydrogen bond here will be not so, will be a little bit weaker, but if it's stronger bound, it'll be stronger. I'll, I'll go to that next, but just keep this, keep this picture a little bit in mind. Sorry, Sorry for the interruption. Uh, is this also in, in room temperature or is this? Uh... Five Kelvin. Five Kelvin, okay, thank you. Yeah, there's no way to, so there's always some, you know, you have to be on top of a sample of, on top of an atom, right? For I don't know, half a minute. Try doing that at room temperature. It long, long the different thermal expansion between the tip and the sample means, you know, that the two things break apart, right? This is really atomic dimensions. Everything five kilo. All right. So, four different oxygen atoms: alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Different density of states, different what we think is proton affinity. So the way how tightly this proton is bound will be different because you know these oxygen atoms are different. As you correctly pointed out, this beta one will be quite different from the others. You put the water down. Margarita dissociates with them, tip moves them around as this force distance curves, and these are now. Very proud of this. These are experimental force distance curves where each of these curves. So this is a representative plot of something we've worked on this paper for three, four years. Something where Margareta has looked at physically three different samples, many, many different physical tips, and done these force distance curves on top of the water OH, the beta OH, the delta OH, and the gamma OH many times, and you can see it's quite representative. So this force distance curves experimentally, so short range force and piconewtons, tip displacement going in and out, is really distinctly different for each of these oxygen atoms. Okay. And then we had this wonderful collaboration with Bernd Meyer, who came up with a reasonable model for this tip and calculated this force distance curves and then you know made these calculations here the ones I showed you before from this one you can extract the z position between the tip and then you can also extract the force between the tip and the sample on top of the water oxygen the beta the delta the gamma, and in theory, you know, you can also do the alpha. Margreta never could put the proton, she could put a few times, but not often enough to get good statistics on the alpha atom. So now it's really nice, okay? I'm very happy. 
So there's really quantitative agreement. So here, point three, okay, this is relevant, right? So here, let me see which one is 345, 348, okay, 246, uh, beta 232. You know, I mean, compared to, no, no, this is the, the error bar we have in our measurement. And this is what we see. It's really wonderful agreement. Okay. How can we understand these force distance curves? So there's really two, there's really two things we can get out of them. So we look at this minima. The minima are the ones that are the relevant ones. Okay. So what is actually plotted here is this delta Z the dip displacement at the minimum. This is in this table. It's relative dip displacement. So there's one ref, the absolute value has not much meaning. So it's the relative displacement to one OH group that we always have this one. Okay, relative displacement, you can see this is the minimum. And that just tells you some OH groups are closer to the surface than others. So it's going in, right? Some OH groups are located a little bit more down, a little bit higher. up. So this is just, so to speak, the geometric height. So you go in and out at this force minimum. This is where you have this hydrogen bond between the oxygen of the tip and the proton of the sample. And where this minimum is located, this is plotted here. So this is this kind of height. And you can see the, the height of the oxygen where the proton is and this force minimum really scale really well. So this is kind of yeah nice, but a little bit trivial, right? I mean, we have measured out how high these oxygen atoms are on the surface. More relevant is if you look at in the theoretical calculations when you have this tip and sample pretty close okay so at this force minimum you have this hydrogen bond length and if you look at this hydrogen bond length here between the la calculated last atom and the tip and the proton you can see the minimum here, where is this force minimum scales, the force minimum, calculated force minimum scales with the hydrogen bond length. Okay. So let's say here, this water oxygen, it really doesn't want, if you have the water OH here, right? It really doesn't want to give away its proton. So the hydrogen bond between the tip and the sample is pretty weak. The hydrogen bond length is long. This force minimum is shallow. This one, the gamma, okay? Gamma here has a, sh a very deeper, less shallow short range force. So that means the hydrogen bond between the tip and the sample is stronger and the hydrogen bond length is also shorter, right? So hydrogen bond, long hydrogen bond, little interaction, short hydrogen bond, strong interaction. And actually note that there is a really nice linear relationship. Okay, any questions? Yeah, yeah. Ulrike, may I ask you, those yeah. force, force distance uh, uh -huh. measurements or spectroscopy is mm -hmm. usually done in the contact mode. How no. is it done in here? Not contact mode. This yeah. is exactly how it's, yeah. or pretty much exactly how it's calculated here. This is constant height mode. Okay. Same here. So the whole thing is in constant height mode, no contact mode, but pretty close to the surface, right? 
Okay, so you do your resonance frequency, you stop somewhere okay. and you go in and out a little bit, but there's no real contact. If there's real contact, you destroy the system yeah, because yeah. then you'd really take this proton out yeah, of you, yeah, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's why I'm asking. And so what about calibration to force? How calibration to force? So what is yeah. what we measure is the change in resonance frequency. And there's something that's yeah. called the SADA equation where you can integrate the frequency and you can calculate the force. Okay, okay. thank you. We have to subtract the long range forces. The long range forces is the Van der Waals interaction between the whole end of the tip and the sample, but there's really good, well-established ways to do that. This is really the chemical force when the last atom of the tip and the sample try to make a chemical bond. That's the one we're interested in. Thank you, Thank you Tomas, for the question. All right, good. So, we have qualitative understanding for this minima in this I should say this is still attractive mode, right? We're not repulsive mode because we're, we're still in the regime where the tip is attracted to the surface. Okay? So we understand the quality if we understand that the position, the position gives you how far the OH group sticks out. The well is how strong is the hydrogen bond between the tip and the sample, which relates to how strong is the proton bound to the back bonded to the surface. So that's great. But what we try to do now is something really brave. We try to get something, we want to relate these beautiful measurements to something chemists can do something with, okay? So how can we get some sort of number or anything out of this? So what would be, even a relevant quantity that we want to look at. Okay. And now we stuck our neck out a little bit. So this is completely different, somewhat different topic then, right? So what this really is, is it somehow, somehow relates to the bronze that acidity of this material, right? Bronsted acidity means bronsted base, base, acid base interactions, how easy it is to give a proton off. So if you have a molecule in aqueous solution, um, how easy with an OH group, how easy is it for a molecule in water to put this proton and give it to a water molecule in water, right? So this really relates to the water that Pavel asked about, right? So, and there is the so-called acidity constant. So how, how acidic are molecules? The acidity constant is you measure or you determine the rate constant of this proton transfer the rate constant that has to do with the change in, in delta G in free energy divided by KT. You determine that somehow. And then if you take the logarithm of this rate constant, you get something that's called the BKA value, which is an essential, essential uh, quantity for essential quantity for oxides for many reasons. That's how oxides in liquid, you know, dissolve, how they react, how all the things. So this BKA value, just to give you a feeling for this, so one, one change in, uh, it, this is really sensitive. So if this delta G acidity changes a little bit because it's a logarithmic case, this changes just a few decades. Okay, so this is basic that acid base behavior in solution. This is gas phase acidity. So ignore that there is a, ignore the fact that there is a water, right? Just let's look at the same reaction in the gas phase 
and let's see and remove a proton. And actually, these are pretty well related. There's this thermodynamical cycle. So if you know this quantity and you know how about changes when you put the whole thing in water, so the solvation changes, if you know those, then you can relate these quantities to each other. So it turns out that this, and you can either look at this gas phase positivity or proton affinity. So the difference is delta H or the entropy rather than, the, uh, than, than uh, the Gibbs free energy. But similar thing, the proton affinity in the gas phase, the proton affinity in the gas phase, how easy it is for any molecule to give off its proton in the gas phase is something that is tabulated. Okay, that's a quantity you can just look up. Like, um, how can we relate these things at all, right? So how, how do people measure any of these things? So people measure acidity constant, actually not even that, what they measure is, what they measure is something that's called the point of zero charge. So at what point, at what pH value is this acid base equilibrium so that the surface has zero charge. So that's one thing people measure. People in catalysis measure this proton affinity. They try to measure this, which relates to this acidity constant in the following way. So um, we started reading literature, right? What, what are people doing? What are people doing? People do things, for example, for zeolites. Zeolites are these cage-like structures essential in you know, catalysis in chemistry, we have usually well-defined protons. So even though they are periodic, so you can say, okay, this proton is here because you have replaced one of the silicon atoms with like, uh, with with another foreign species. And then these proton affinities, and this paper by Gord, Ray Gord, is actually measured by absorbing different molecules here and measuring how how strong is this molecule absorbed to this proton. And they do that for different molecules. So these are for different molecules. This is the PA, the proton affinity. The proton affinity, tabulated proton affinity in gas phase for these different molecules. This is the heat of absorption they have measured. And then from that, they can actually say, okay, these, how acidic, how easy it is for these protons in zeolites to, how acidic is the zeolite? But that's how people do it. So we like, okay. Let's try to do something similar for our Let's try to do similar for our measurements, right? And the measurements, because you can always do this, the whole thing, right? The whole surface, but atom for atom. So now comes this, you know, I've been pestering Bernd Meyer for the longest time, a collaborator to do that. So he came up with this idea. So what he did was he did in the computer, right? in the computer, he did this force distance measurements of the tip that he identified gave quantitative agreement with our experiment on molecules, let's say acetic acid. Acetic acid has an OH group, has this proton affinity that you can look up in the NIST database. And he calculated these force distance curves like before. And then he mesh, he determines this minimum, right? Remember, we have this minimum in the force distance curve, so the minimum. So what force minimum? That minimum B can reduce for where is acetic acid for this one here? Looked up 450 kilovolts and plotted it. And he did that for all sorts of different, all sorts of different uh molecules. Okay. 
and I found a straight line. Ha, okay. We call this our calibration line. So we say, okay, maybe this can help us. So we can, it's our hypothesis now, we can really say, okay, this force minima relates to proton affinity in a linear fashion. So force minimum of proton affinity of this one gives this force minimum. So now we play Fred. We take Margareta's measured force distance curves on our beta oxygen. We read off what is the force minimum. We put it in this plot and we say, we think this is the proton affinity of our beta oxygen. And this smeared out things are these error bars. And then we do the same thing for the gamma oxygen, the delta oxygen, and the water oxygen. And you can see that the proton affinity changes quite a bit across these different oxygen atoms. So if you take now this these numbers here at face value, then this um, then this um, beta, this gamma oxygen is somewhere between these two different molecules. I don't. This is acetic acid. I don't know the one of this one. So closer to this one. This one is closer to H two OH, and this one is of course very very has a very high proton affinity. It means it doesn't really want to give off its proton. So. The lower this value, the easier it is to give off the proton, the more acidic it is. Now, you know, no one has ever done this, right? So is this a completely crazy idea? So we did some, some, some sanity checks. So actually you cannot calculate this proton affinity in the affinity functional theory. It's, you can calculate relative proton affinities, but for technical reasons, it's really impossible to calculate these proton affinities in absolute numbers. But these relative proton affinities, you can see those are pretty well identified. So those are these arrows here. And then the question is, gives this proton affinity values the right order of magnitude? And the answer is yes. So yes, we are if we take this proton affinities that we have measured here and stuck it in this thermodynamic cycle, we get a point of zero charge. It's about the pH of nine, which is the one that's been measured for the oxide. So it's not completely wrong, but it's pretty bright. So we say that the proton affinity on this indium oxide, different oxygen atoms varies quite a bit. And we can assess, I don't know, measure, I would say assess the proton affinity of these individual oxygen atoms, atom by atom. Now I submitted this paper and, you know, one referee was enthusiastic. One referee asked all sorts of technical questions, you know, how do this force distance curves and blah, blah, blah. And one said, ah, this is all ultra high vacuum, no one cares. Also, it's only good for indium oxide. Who cares about indium oxide? So we tried to see how does this relate to another material? One where it's known that this material is much more acidic than indium oxide. And indium oxide is actually not very acidic. It means it really tries to keep its proton. But if you look up this, uh, these numbers in the literature for this point of zero charge, you find that TO2 is much, much more acidic. So then, this was during the lockdown last year, we sneaked in Martin Setwin in the lab. 
and they signed him with trying to do this experiment on a different sample. So what he did was he repaired the tip on indium oxide, repeated Margarita's measurements, not for all of the ones, but only for this, for the ones that come for free, for the for these two. Reproduced these measurements, which made sure we had the same tip, and then move the tip on the TO2 surface. We have also OH groups, these ones here, made four distance curves here, and measured a minimum that's really, really much, much lower, which he didn't tell Bernd what the minimum is, but he did this calculation, and again, you know, pretty good agreement. So if we now take this measurement that Martin did here, oops, sorry, Martin did, ah, Martin did here, ah, come on. So you can see that the proton affinity of a proton of TO2 is, the number is much less, so it behaves much more like HNO3, which is a much, strong acid, meaning it gives off its proton much more easily, which is qualitatively what we predicted. And then, yeah, I'm running out of time. So we actually did this for two more materials, and right now we're going and trying to do this for other materials as well, because we have this vision. We have this vision that we can measure this proton affinity not only of different oxides, but we can also measure it atom by atom of different sites, right? So the surface is heterogeneous, the surface has steps, the surface has impurities, the surface has other molecules, and no one can find out what is the behavior of this one atom in this hydrogen transfer reactions. So we think we could measure it, and then because we maybe measure it, because maybe we can then tune the thing in the long, long run. So this is was really part of my ERC proposal to try to make this proof of principle in some sort of method where you can really find ways to measure these individual properties of these oxide surfaces. So that's how far I am. I think we have five more minutes, but I have Tons of thing prepared. I will not go there. I would rather stop here and then maybe if there's some questions, answer questions. If not, we just stop a little bit earlier. So, yesterday and today, you have learned for simple oxides the easy rules to protect the energy surfaces. We have learned about the electronic structure, defects, induced gap states. We've learned polarons. We have talked about islet states in post transition metal oxides. We have now understand how to interpret atomic to resolve the STEM and why this can only be together with DFT modeling. We have learned to understand how this non-contact AFM works and how we can functionalize the surface to get really good images of oxides. And then our brave new <laughs> result on how we try to relate atom resolved measurements to these very fundamental quantities, the photo affinity. I think I stop here. So happy to answer any questions you might have. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I was not in your presentation yesterday, uh, uh -huh. but here I just understood you already talked about the uh, band gap and uh, reducing the uh, TiO2 band gap. Yes. And now uh, you were talking about DFT, right? Yes. Um, I want to know, is there any match uh, or, I mean, between the experimental um, uh, and, uh, I mean, this theoretical uh, band gap for TiO2 in your work, uh, or maybe I'm uh, in a right, a wrong way. I don't know. You explain about, uh, I mean, experimental work yesterday or not? No, I didn't mention okay. that. That's Sorry. a very Sorry. point. I did mention a little bit. 
There's a very good point that in DFT, the band gap is always too small for technical reasons, because the exchange interaction that we take into account is not taken into properly. One way you can do that is by just tweaking what's called the Hubbard Q, um, which is really like a fudge factor in TFT calculations. So if you increase the Hubbard U and the deuterium atoms, you can change the band gap to whatever value we want. Mm -hmm. um, what we have found out is that by using, so we have done field states as the M images on two different materials on two to rutile and anatase in a paper that we published a few years ago. And we carefully looked at the properties that we see in experiment with STM and then collaborated with the group in theory here with Georg Ress's group. And then they have found that when they take a U of 3.9 EV, they can really see the switch over from this polaronic behavior. So they only can get the band gap right, but they can also see this switch over polaronic. So how, how the localized these excess electrons are in Rutal and Enra is, you can really see that this switches from one material to the next one. So that gives them a really good handle on what kind of value to use. So, the answer of Georg Gresse, if you want to do TO2 and interest in electronic structure, and you want to do relatively cheap DFT calculations, you should use a Hubbard U of 3.9. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Because I was working in experimental for a long time and I was working in the band gap of TIO2. Mm -hmm. uh, and always it was interesting for me to working with the group to uh, do some, I mean, DFT or something to uh, see is there any confirmation of this theoretical wave, uh, wave for, uh, I mean, our experimental work. So mm -hmm. nice to, I mean, um, um, uh, have you now as a, um, I mean, um, uh, nice person to working in uh, DFT. Thank oh. you so much. Thank you for the question. Anyone else wants to ask something? Uh, can I ask uh, one question, please? Yes. Well, it's really a very nice uh, presentation and uh, I'm a chemist and I would like to ask you, uh, what do you mean active? Uh, catalytic sites on a surface. What you can say in this uh, uh, sentence? What okay. Is an active site from catalytical point of view. Active yes. site on a surface. The active site is. Um, I should maybe I showed you at the beginning. Right, this was my question. This Mentimeter. You have these different oxygen atoms. Which one will be most active? Which one? If you take water and put the proton on the different oxygen atoms, which one gives the lowest energy? Right? So different atoms on different surfaces will behave in a different way. So if you have atoms at steps, sometimes uh, if you have a catalytic reaction on any reaction, um, because of the properties of the sites of the different atomic sites on the surface, those are the ones that will be mainly involved in the catalytic reaction. In a nutshell, right? So, uh, what, for example, when I, I didn't I had a long speech prepared about single atom catalysis. So, if you take an oxide surface, put single metal atoms, and you try to look at CO oxidation, CO will not absorb on the metal at all. It will just come and go again, but it will stick to this one foreign atom you put. Will it absorb? There will be able to snatch an oxygen from the from the sample and make carbon dioxide. So this would be a clear active site that you have purposely put in on your sample. Does this answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh. Hey. Any more? I want to ask something. Mm -hmm. So I'm a PhD student in uh, Baran Aaron's group. Maybe you know him. Um, and I have like written a research proposal lately, um, measuring serum oxide and also copper oxide. But we measure them in in ambient pressures. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you if this like mountain molecules and AFM can, like, can be done also in ambient pressure. 
no. environment, not at all, or any. I I don't know like anything. I mean, you can certainly do very interesting measurements. There's no question. But these type of measurements that I've shown, we can identify every each and every molecule, mm -hmm. each and every atom, and really link it to DFT calculations. Honestly, not just doing the calculation and but really link it honestly. I think you can only do with these very idealized conditions. You know, ultra high vacuum, perfect single crystals, low temperature. Um, so if so, I personally measuring on iris uh, setup. If you know what it is, like uh, iris, in, yeah, in, yeah, infrared on other beds, but. But if I do want to take it to, to an AFM, I should just use like a simple tip or like, what do you think? I'm not sure exactly what your, what your question is. I mean, like, can I measure it with tip like made of only metal or like, that's what you would suggest? Like arrows, you're not doing infrared measurements or? No, I mean, like taking it to an AFM, like the uh -huh. same, the same environment, same uh, crystal. I mean, you certainly can look at things with AFM, but you will not see individual molecules and how they behave, right? I mean, we we'll look, if ideal case, you maybe see if it's a nice flat surface, maybe you see these steps and things like this. But really seeing the individual atom, I don't think that is just possible. It's just too much air and too much other stuff around in the ambient. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. So, so maybe, maybe there is no question. So, so we, we would like to thank you very much, Ulrike, for this nice comprehensive talk. And hopefully that you have inspired a, a lot of people listening to it, maybe including Pavel Tomanchak. Maybe he will start thinking about using it so for his or the biomolecule molecules. Sorry. So oh, well, am I right? Or I think he left already. He left. Left. Yeah. Okay, but I will ask. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, okay. you know, it's a long so, way to go, I think. But I think we can get things we cannot get any other way. But I've been only enjoyed it. Thanks you guys thank for you. all the questions. It really helped. And thank you, Ulrike. Bye-bye.